Hello, my name is Declan O'Dempsey. I'm a barrister at Cloisters Chambers and this is a talk about uh, whether you're protected as somebody who's thinking of blowing the whistle on wrongdoing. It makes a difference who you're uh, disclosing to. Um, it's easier to be protected if your disclosure is to your employer, but for other people, other recipients of the information, they're a different requirement. The most favourable position is if you disclose to your employer or somebody authorised to receive disclosures on behalf of your uh, employer. In practice, most disclosures will be made to the employer. If your disclosure was made uh, before the 25th of June uh, 2013, there's a requirement that the disclosure must be made in good faith. If the disclosure is made on or after that date, then you don't have to be able to establish that the disclosure was made in good faith. You will um, have to show, however, that the disclosure was in the uh, public interest. But if your employer has a whistleblowing procedure, for, or for example a grievance or harassment procedure, which allows you to make disclosure to an external uh, third party, then the tribunal will treat that third party as if they're your employer and apply the same rules uh, to them. Next, you may decide to disclose to a responsible person, as the Act has it. The Act deals with this under Section 43, capital C, 1B, and this would be somebody, for example, like the employer's client. The question here will be uh, whether you reasonably believe uh, that the client, for example, or the customer, or the person to whom you disclose, had legal responsibility for the information that you disclosed uh, to them. But it won't cover, for example, um, a former director uh, where the information doesn't impinge on their rights as a former uh, director. Have a look at the case of Premier Mortgage Connections Limited and Miller, EAT uh, 113 of 2007. What's required is that the recipient has to have ongoing legal responsibility for that matter at the time of uh, the disclosure. But you'll still be protected if you reasonably believed that the recipient did have legal responsibility for the matter in question. You might want to disclose to uh, legal advisers um, under Section 43 capital D of the Employment Rights Act 1996. Um, if you are telling your legal advisor information about malpractices, about the listed wrongdoings, then you will be uh, protected. Uh, you don't have to uh, act in good faith when you're making uh, the, that disclosure, and it doesn't matter when uh, that disclosure is made for that purpose. Uh, next, uh, you might uh, want to make a disclosure to a government minister or a member of the Scottish executive. Uh, you'll be protected if you're employed by uh, some basically the things that are appointed under or by legislation. This will cover things like the NHS or a regulator or something like uh, a statutory tribunal. Have a look at Section 43, capital E of the Act. You do not need to have uh, disclosed uh, to your employer first. There is a list of prescribed persons to whom disclosures can also be made. Um, broadly speaking, these are the regulators. It's a long list and so you should have a look on the internet for the Public Interest Disclosure Prescribed Persons Order of 2014. I've given you the reference uh, on the slide. It tells you who you can go to and what aspects they deal with. Biz has also put out guidance on whistleblowing which is worth reading before uh, making uh, your disclosure, if of course that's possible. You in order to be protected, have reasonably to believe that the wrongdoing is within the remit of the regulator or prescribed person, and that the information disclosed is substantially 
true. If you made the disclosure before the 25th of June 2013, you'll only be protected if you made it in good faith. It is always worth, before disclosing to the prescribed person, to check whether what you are disclosing is a qualifying disclosure. But even if it is, how can you reasonably believe that the information is true in substance? So it may be reasonable, for example, to uh, check the information that you've got before disclosing to the prescribed person. So you might want to check uh, with colleagues uh, as to whether you, the facts are correct. Have a look at the case of Barton and Royal Barrett of Greenwich, which is a, an EAT, Employment Appeal Tribunal case, number 41 of 2014. What if you want to make a disclosure to someone who is not a prescribed person? There are um, additional or different requirements to be uh, satisfied. You need to ask yourself whether you have a reasonable belief that the information disclosed and an, uh, any allegation in it uh, is uh, substantially true. You should have previously disclosed substantially, i.e. more or less the same information uh, to your employer or a prescribed person. Uh, you mustn't be doing the disclosure for gain, personal gain, and this doesn't include rewards that are offered under statute. And so HMRC, for example, sometimes offers rewards. So you've either previously disclosed or uh, you believe reasonably that you'll receive a detriment from your employer if you disclose the information to them or to the prescribed person. There's a good faith disclosure um, before uh, the 25th of June uh, 2013 and it's got to be reasonable in all the circumstances for you to make the disclosure. Finally, if there's no prescribed person, an additional condition is that you must reasonably believe that material evidence is going to be concealed or destroyed if you make a disclosure to your employer. There's a different set of conditions if you are disclosing exceptionally serious wrongdoing to people who are not uh, regulators, prescribed persons, etc. So you've got to reasonably believe, so it's got to be objectively reasonable to believe, uh, that the information and any allegation in it is substantially true. You mustn't make the disclosure for personal gain. And it's got to be reasonable in all the circumstances uh, of the case for you to make the disclosure to the person to whom you make it, uh, having regard especially uh, to uh, their identity. Uh, in this case, you don't need to show that you've raised it previously internally uh, or uh, a belief that evidence uh, will be uh, destroyed if you disclose to your employer. But it will probably only cover really serious matters which needs immediate revelation. Let's look at that concept of reasonableness in that type of wider uh, disclosure. So the tribunal will look at the identity of the recipient, the seriousness of the default, the wrongdoing, whether the wrongdoing was continuing or likely to occur in the future, uh, whether you've breached an obligation of confidentiality owed by your employer to a third party. Now, that's a relevant consideration, but it's not the be-all and end-all, it's not decisive. The tribunal will also want to know if you did disclose to your employer whether they did anything about it or whether they uh, could do anything about it. In other words, did they take remedial steps? They'll look at your individual circumstances and you should explain these to them. W is there a reason, a particular reason, why you'd go to one person uh, rather uh, than uh, another? The factors which tribunal can look at will be based around section 43 capital G3 of the uh, 1996 uh, Act. Uh, in the case of Bobula I mentioned earlier, 
uh, the fact that uh, the person was a an American citizen was a circumstance uh, which told the tribunal something as to why it was reasonable for them to go and talk to the CIA and FBI. So in this context, let's look at um, disclosure to the press. What the tribunal will want to know is if this was your first port of call, what was the urgency, why did it have to be disclosed in this particular way, were there really no alternatives, and whether you couldn't have used any alternatives that did exist. The question still remains whether it's reasonable to disclose to the press in all of the circumstances, and of course it must not be done for personal gain. There are a number of exceptions from a protection and these are uh, set out in the uh, 1996 Act. So, a lawyer who discloses legally privileged uh, material will not be protected. If you commit a crime by making the disclosure, you won't be protected. So if the disclosure itself is a crime, this will be only things like breach of the Official Secrets Act. And there are restrictions on uh, parliamentary staff and members of the armed forces. Now, these two categories are the protected in a limited way. They're protected against dismissal, but they're not protected against detriments due to whistleblowing. Confidentiality agreements are quite popular with uh, some uh, employers, but Section 43.1 of the Employment Rights Act makes it clear that a contractual term is void to the extent that it purports uh, to preclude you making a protected disclosure. You can be protected if you've suffered a detriment as a result, so caused by uh, your employer's reaction to uh, making a disclosure. But whether what you've suffered is a detriment will depend on whether a reasonable worker uh, would think that what happened to you is a detriment. So it's not enough to have an unjustified sense of grievance. A detriment can be something done or omitted to be done by the employer and it can occur during or after the employment. Now, once a detriment has occurred, you've got three months in which to bring a claim to the Employment Tribunal. And you must now ensure that you contact ACAS before presenting your claim to the Employment Tribunal and talk to them about early conciliation. Time starts to run, those three months, run from the date of the detriment. The employer is going to be liable for the um, detriment you suffer unless they can show that they took all reasonable steps to prevent the detrimental uh, treatment. Also a co-worker, if they victimise you because you blew the whistle, uh, will also be uh, personally liable, so that means you can take them to the tribunal as well as your employer. You're protected against dismissal on the grounds of a protected disclosure. There's no minimum qualification period. You don't have to be in employment for a particular period of time. And there's no upper limit to the compensation that can be recovered. One unusual feature is that you can get what they call interim relief uh, from your dismissal. That is an order that your contract continues in terms of payment and so forth. Uh, but you must present your claim to the Employment Tribunal within a very short period of time, seven days of the dismissal. And you've got to be able to persuade them, uh, but very broadly, that you're likely to win uh, at trial. You've got three months within which to present your claim. Again, you've got to contact ACAS to start early conciliation. That may have a, an impact on the amount of time you have to present your claim. But you can only present a claim once you've gone through the early conciliation process and time, the three months, runs from the date of dismissal. Finally, the uh, Employment Tribunal is entitled, with your consent, to send details of your whistleblowing claim directly to a relevant regulator. But, as I say, they need to have your consent to do this. So before making a disclosure, it is worth considering uh, whether or not you satisfy the tests that will be applied to you uh, if you've already made a disclosure and uh, feel that you've been punished uh, about it, then 
uh, it is worth seeking uh, legal advice. Thank you very much.